Soy Javier Tourón, vicerrector de Innovación y Desarrollo Educativo en la Universidad Internacional de La Rioja y os doy la bienvenida a esta nueva entrevista eh, de la serie de diálogos sobre eh, educación, talento, tecnología, que suelo tener con figuras relevantes del mundo educativo en los ámbitos que son de, de mi interés. Eh, Today, I have uh, the great pleasure to introduce you uh, to one of the key professors in gifted education that for those who have a minimum training don't need any introduction at all. Uh, she was a, a classroom teacher as well as an administrator for 15 years before becoming a professor at the mm -hmm. university. Um, Uh, she has authored or co-authored more than 250 publications uh, who appear in many relevant journals like the American Educational Research Journal or the Journal of Educational Research, American Psychologies, Exceptional Children, Phi Delta Kappa, etc. Uh, her research interests um, Uh, are related to academically talented students, talent development, mm -hmm. uh, talent development in women, uh, also uh, learning disabilities, uh, underachievers, mm -hmm. uh, poverty, etc. Uh, she is a very well-known scholar in the field, and as you already discovered, she is Sally Race, and she is at the University of Connecticut. Um, so thank you very much for visiting uh, UNIR and for uh, dedicating us a few moments of your time. Uh, today has been a hard day because you were recording mm -hmm. for us as well. So I have a, a few questions that I should like to, to pose you in this short interview. Mm -hmm. You have been working extensively on the uh, enrichment model, the, the SEM, school-wide enrichment model uh, for many years with uh, Joseph Rensuli. Uh, could you describe uh, for our audience, just to foster them to go to the sources and go in mm -hmm. depth, uh, two or three main characteristics of this model? How, how that perhaps are the keys of why this is so popular and is, it's been used in so many countries? Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you and, uh, and to speak with you about the school-wide enrichment model. I think one of the reasons, or a few of the reasons, that the SEM is so popular is that it is a strength-based talent development model um, that can be used in schools that want to offer some enrichment to all students. So uh, for places that consider uh, services for a very small percentage of students not something they want to do, oftentimes they will look to the school-wide enrichment model um, because we offer certain levels of enrichment for everybody, for all students, such as exposure to new ideas and uh, creative and critical thinking skills, while also reserving some more advanced opportunities for more advanced students. I think the other reason that um, people, so many different schools and countries are interested in the school-wide enrichment model is that we have conducted so much research on it. So it is a, a research-based um, but practice-driven model um, that we have been uh, really conducting research on for almost four decades. We know how it works, we know where it works, we know why it works and we know how to best implement it. And I think because of the research base, people feel more comfortable um, using it because they realize the benefits to students. Oh, wonderful. Uh, we hear frequently uh, from many school voices that it is not possible. Perhaps it's desirable, but it's not possible to differentiate. Mm -hmm and give uh, different uh, services mm -hmm. to different needs, different mm -hmm. students. Um, what is a bit contradictory with the, what you propose in your model, mm -hmm. what would you say to those teachers uh, that think that differentiation is really impossible? They want to do it, but that's not real. 
Well, I would say that, you know, based on our field tests and our research and our practice, that it is possible. It's challenging. It's, it's not easy. But the results of it are very, very important for students. So um, I think people sometimes have to realize that you can start slowly. You can start with a few students that are the most obvious candidates for differentiation and that you can make it easier by using the tools that are now available. The internet, for example, cluster grouping to reduce the range of students. Um, we've seen thousands and thousands of teachers differentiate instruction, learn to do it and do it well, and we've seen the benefits for students. So with approximately eight or nine grade levels of reading, represented in every elementary school classroom and middle school classroom, we have to differentiate. It's not a matter of, of whether we do it, it's how we do it. We must do it, uh, or else students will fail to make continuous progress. So it is possible, um, it isn't easy, um, but at the same time, it's something that's absolutely necessary if we want children to continue to progress and, and encounter challenge in their academic lives. So implementing this model in any school is not a matter of uh, huge resources or a reduced yeah. ratio teacher-students? I've seen um, teachers differentiate in very large classrooms. I've seen teachers differentiate in very challenging teaching situations. New York City, uh, Chile, <laughs> um, Spain, rural America. So. It is, it, you are able to differentiate regardless of where you teach and, um, and regardless of resources. It's a matter of desire and it's a matter of understanding what your students need to be successful. Yeah. Well, uh, some teachers deny the need to, uh, for serving the more able. Some mm -hmm. others even uh, uh, question the existence of them, mm -hmm. no? And others accept the need, as I mentioned, but don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Could you describe briefly uh, what is the approach you have for the teacher training programs? Yes. So we, we at the University of Connecticut provide opportunities for training in the summer. We run a summer institute called Confertute. We offer courses both in person and in line. Um, we have a certificate program. We offer consulting opportunities and we post most of our materials. I think the other thing that's important is that we have conducted the research about um, parts of the school-wide enrichment model such as curriculum compacting. So we know how we can train teachers and we know how this can be done um, more easily and, and many of our results are also free and available online. So in person, online, in the summer, during the school year, at places like your university, um, we try to make uh, a lot of what we've learned to make curriculum compacting and differentiation and implementing the school-wide enrichment model more accessible and easier. But it's a matter of somebody just understanding that they don't have a choice. <laughs> When, again, we have students at 11, our, my latest research on reading showed that we, in the average fifth or sixth grade classroom, we have 11 different grade levels of reading instruction um, that students are, are experiencing. So we must provide some level of differentiation. Uh, it's just a matter of how we get started. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make a reference to Rinsuli Learning. Mm -hmm. That is, a, I, th I guess, is a well, I'm convinced, really, it's a beautiful platform mm -hmm. uh, to uh, implement differentiation, mm -hmm. to have a profile of every student. Uh, but most of the resources are in English. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, use or exhibit this to the teachers in Spain or in mm -hmm. non-speaking countries, mm -hmm. they say, OK, this sounds, looks nice, but uh, we are not very skillful with mm -hmm. the English language. Do you think this platform could be used, uh, the, the language barrier could be removed and could be implemented in, in for example, in Spanish-speaking countries? I do, um, I do. We currently have the opportunities and, and the resources 
to, to translate the profiler. So in Renzulli Learning, students sit down at a computer and they take a series of questionnaires. They complete questionnaires about their interests, their learning styles, their product styles, and then they get a strength profiler. That is already able to be translated into multiple languages. And then they are matched with um, resources. So uh, 50,000 enrichment resources that we have included mainly from the United States. But what I see as the future of Renzulli Learning is um, partnerships with different countries where some of our best English resources can be used. Um, things like uh, primary source material from the Library of Congress or museums, the Smithsonian Museum's exhibits, for example, but also that local uh, resources can be added by countries. So if you see it as a platform that can be actually added to, so, well, so in Spain we might have teachers all over Spain adding resources for students that are in Spanish. The same thing could be done you know, in Portuguese, the same thing could be done in German, then what we would have is really uh, resources that are culturally appropriate and in the languages that can be used um, and understood by children in that country. So I see it more as a platform and, and partnership opportunities, again, so that we, we've developed a tool that can provide enrichment easier, that's more easy to access, and that will help teachers enrich and differentiate in a much more interesting and efficient way. So this could become a multilingual, yes, multi-purpose. Yes. Yes. I will keep this idea in mind. Okay. Well, you are an expert on gender differences. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have many problems with identification here in this country because 98 or more of the kids are even not identified by any right. means. Mm -hmm. uh, but from those identified, mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly the percentage, but two thirds are boys and mm -hmm. one third, more or less, uh, right. are uh, girls. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us something about the, why this happened, how we could avoid this? huge difference that do not uh, match as the reality because uh, we it's impossible to, to maintain that mm -hmm. boys are smarter than girls. Right. <laughs> well, a lot of the reason that, and this happened in the United States earlier in our field, um, some of the reasons that boys are more often identified as gifted than girls is that they, they talk more in class, they act out more, sometimes they even misbehave more so they get more teacher attention. But another very, very important reason that girls are less often identified is because of the assessments, the kinds of tests we give. So t boys tend to do better uh, on tests, they are answer more quickly, um, and sometimes girls need more time. So for example, boys score higher on the SAT than girls because it's a time test. If you remove the timing, some research shows girls do just as well. So you have to look at how you're identifying the tests that you're using, the ways that teachers are being trained to identify boys versus girls, and make a concerted effort to use instruments that are fair to girls and make sure teachers look for characteristics uh, in girls that also would lead them to be identified. Uh, there certainly are as many gifted girls out there as there are gifted boys. It's just a matter of how we find them. Okay, thank you. Well, I have a last question for you. Uh, again, let's be creative and think that the Ministry of Education mm -hmm of a virtual country, huh? mm -hmm. perhaps this one, but mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't think it. Or the local authorities ask you to say, okay, Professor Reis, uh, we need your advice. Uh, how could we or what we should do at the beginning of a serious uh, promotion of talent development mm -hmm. and, and serving the gifted in the schools? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is that the opportunity to conduct research, good research about the strategies that we use and the models that we use for gifted and talented 
programs and children is critical. And very few countries um, sponsor support research. And as a, as a researcher yourself, you know how important that is. And second is services. Um, direct services to students, governor's schools, summer programs, services in schools, opportunities for teachers to be trained to, to use uh, models such as the school-wide enrichment model is critical. Uh, and then creativity programs, programs such as Invention Convention. Um, in the United States, we would love to see every child in the country have the opportunity to learn to be more creative and to come up with problems that solve some of the, the, the solutions that solve some of the biggest problems that we experience. So I really see those three areas. Funds for research, funds for statewide and local programs and initiatives, and then um, actual direct services for children that could be sponsored by the governor government that will help children use their talents to make the world a better place. Oh, fantastic. Well, we could, we, we could be talking for hours mm -hmm. because uh, all this area is so interesting and so crucial for mm -hmm. social development. But again, I have not to abuse of your time and thank patience. You. Uh, thank you very much for coming to UNIR. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interview and for your contribution to our, our experto in mm -hmm. altas capacidades y desarrollo del talento. Uh, uh, your talk and the talk from Professor Ransuli as well will be a pressure a treasure mm -hmm. of the resources that we will keep for our students to really uh, access to serious models and serious research. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to visit your beautiful country. Muchas gracias. <laughs>